Okay, so after Constantinople was taken in April 1204 by the people of uh, the Fourth Crusade, they chose their own emperor, so the so-called Latin emperor, and this person became Count Baldwin of Flanders. Okay, so he only had Constantinople in some areas, but over the less, various crusader powers control one half of the imperial lands. And you can see here on this map how this was happening by those circled areas, right? You can see that Alexios the Sword, he held territories in modern day Greece, right? Fedor Laskaris became an important, uh, an important pretender to uh, the role of a unifying Byzantine uh, power. And then also there was territories of John Angelus Ducas right here, right? So, which is roughly on the border with modern day Albania. So kind of, uh, there were various independent enclaves that pretend to be uh, successors to the Byzantine Empire. And there are various crusader powers. There are also Bulgarians, right? And there are Seljuks. So, and the Seljuks is important because now Seljuks, they were in decline, but they uh, will be will be substituted by the Ottoman Turks who uh, would, co would consider their founding father and not uh, Osman, person of Osman. So now what were the succeeding states of the Byzantine Empire? Okay, so Empire of Thessalonica, right? Uh, Trabizond on the, on the, on the, uh, Sea of the Black, uh, on the shore of the Black Sea, right opposite Russia, sort of nowadays Turkish uh, Black Shore uh, Sea. Uh, Epirus, which is uh, on the border between Greece uh, and uh, Albania, and Serbia, and Bulgarians also were there. Yeah, I would probably put Bulgaria. Okay. So, so the Byzantine Empire started to exist in splinters. I really hope, I really hope that you kind of not just, not just how to say robotically consume this information, which probably I shouldn't think anyway, because I don't think that any, that I should think this way about people. But uh, I just hope, I just really hope that you will uh analyze all what we discuss and compare it with other histories that you study because i mean it's very rich material it's very rich material to come to make comparisons with other of his other stories sort of like empire existing uh as as uh without having capital it kind of like similar to maybe like think about uh, Poland. Poland was partitioned by three countries, uh, three countries, Russia, Prussia, uh, and uh, Austria, and didn't exist for all of the century. Then it was erected, then, it's, then the Germans and the Soviets put it to the end, then it's resurrected again. Or like think about Irish. Irish, they don't speak Gaelic, they speak English, but tell it to Irish, no. You are not Irish because you don't speak the English. You don't speak. You don't speak the. You don't. You don't speak uh, the language, and you will learn right so pretty quick. This is this is kind of uh, similar uh, to some extent. Gives food for the sword. Okay, so uh, Alexius the sword. He controlled Western Frag, uh, Thrace, uh, and Thessalonica. 
and Bulgarians are Kalayan, started also to uh, uh, chop up of the borderlands. Okay. So since at this point where it's a very low point, kind of similar to what the Western Roman Empire experienced in the fifth century. Okay, now. So Fyodor Laskaris, who held uh, the territory around Nicaea, was destined to be the king of the hill. And interestingly, it was kind of like international border. So international border between Byzantium and uh, the Latin Empire of Constantinople was somewhere between Nicaea, which is a seven hour uh, far right. It's called Iznik nowadays, the Turkish city, Iznik. And Nicaea was the sole city of the Byzantine Empire after Thessaloniki. Okay, so, uh, and uh, uh, so following, following, I mean, and there was this international border, right? But it was not really a border that was not, uh, uh, that cannot be crossed, okay? So, okay. And uh, Nicaea uh, was supposed to, supposed to be uh, a winner a winner state is supposed to be uh, 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 among other com uh, competitors. Okay, so now, and the empire of Trapezunt, which I will show it to you uh, in a moment where, is it, where, where it was, uh, survived until 1261. So basically when this empire of Trapezunt was taken by the Ottomans, it was the end of the Byzantine empire. So it's kind of lasted for a number of years after uh, after Constantinople was taken by Mehmed II. Father, did you say 1261? <laughs> I thought it was uh, 1461. Yes, 1461. Yes, okay. yes, 1461. Yes. Okay. So. Okay, you see here crusading states, right? You see here crusading states. I mean, more than crusading states, actually. You see all succeeding states uh, from, from the Byzantine Empire. Okay. And here is the empire of Trapezont, and this is Black Sea. So the Crimea will be over there, okay. And that's where various Italian uh, uh, Genoese, as I mean, they had their outposts. Okay. And this is Despotate of Epirus. Please look at this map. It's a very good one, which also competed uh, to be uh, a major unifying power. Okay. So various islands were taken little by little uh, by Venetians. And some of them, luckily, for the residents like Corfu, they were never Ottomans, or, were, or they were Ottomans for very short nominal uh, period of time, because they changed hands from the Byzantine hands in, into, into the Venetian hands, which was, I mean, pretty good. Pretty good, I mean, you know, people were still able to confess their faith there and so 
that was uh, not bad, not bad. Okay, so right, it was a big question of uh, succession and uh, uh, Bulgarians help kind of crusaders were weak in Constantinople. So it's no wonder that Tsar Kalayan was able, the Bulgarian Tsar Kalayan was able to defeat them. Okay, the first, uh, the first uh, Latin king of Constantinople, Balduin, he was taken a prisoner of war by Bulgarians and then he disappeared. So his brother Henry uh, became his successor. And now meet the Paleologi dynasty, right? Uh, and uh, uh, Pale uh, Michael VIII Paleologus, he represented connection with uh, an, a number of uh, noble families of the empire, okay? And uh, he, at the death of Frodo VIII Lascaris, took over the Nicene Empire. And Frodo VIII, he was a capable ruler, but he suffered from a family disease of epilepsy. So he died prematurely and his wife was already dead. So he uh, left his uh, young son. Okay, so he left his young son uh, with re regents. So in this council of regents included patriarch Arsenius and a nobleman Ferdinand Muzalon. Okay. So and also, and also uh, the future Michael VIII uh, Paleologus. And Michael VIII already demonstrated his uh, abilities when he arranged brilliant disinformation leakage to the anti nicene coalition troops uh, that in fact Nicene army was huge. So, and, and this information helped him to, to win over uh, the Crusaders, okay. But I mean, Crusaders, unfortunately, as, 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 as we were saying, as I was saying that uh, for people back then, taxation meant a lot and kind of conditions of life meant a lot as I guess for us today. So that's why so many Byzantine imperial bureaucrats they joined Mehmed II. They joined Mehmed II uh, and uh, started to use their know-how to serve Mehmed uh, as, as their new uh, master. So similarly, people would not mind to have crusaders instead of Byzantine emperors. Not Some of them were very patriotic uh, and uh, others would be happy if crusaders would not mess with their uh, culture and would not tax them heavily. But crusaders, similarly to the Nazis in the uh, occupied uh, Soviet territories, they alien alienated people. They really lost the benefit of the doubt. So, and especially when they started to force people in Constantinople to accept uh, Latin Christendom, to accept uh, Latin patriarch, patriarchate. And uh, there was Latin patriarch uh, Morazini, who even concealed all Byzantine churches for a while. Then Henry uh, opened them quickly because it was very destabilizing uh, act. But sort of, you can see that crusaders failed at uh, providing 
an appealing model and setting up an appealing a model that would appeal to people. They would say, I don't want to go to Nicaea. I'm really happy under the lattice in Constantinople. No, it was not the case. So there was constant leakage of people who would, uh, who would leave Constantinople. So kind of people were fed up with crusaders, okay? Therefore, they, they, they lost the city very, very easily, very stupidly, okay? So Michael Lascaris was crowned an emperor in Nicaea. And then uh, similarly, uh, uh, symmetrically, Michael's uh, half-brother, Feodor Dukas, took over uh, Thessalonica from Crusaders and he was crowned an emperor there as well. So figure it, now, figure it out who, who is an authentic emperor now. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, John the Sword, Vatatsis, he became emperor in Nicaea in 1222. He also defeated uh, Latins and then he exported, exported uh, Polarci, uh, or, or also known as Cumans, and uh, settled them in his land to use them against the Latins, which also sort of only a good thing when you are uh, uh, incapacity to control them. So, but if you just trust them, I mean, sooner or later, it's it's like like a beast. They have instincts, uh, and they would take over. That's that's normal. So, but I mean, uh, nevertheless, it was for a short relief. Uh, it was uh, it was useful. And even John Vatatze started to build a fleet, uh, to build a navy to fight the nations, which was very ambitious. So he took over Gallipoli, which was important to control the straits. Okay, now there are new players and they are Mongols. Okay, sort of, uh, that's Mongols that Russians suffered terribly at the same at this time. Uh, okay, uh, John the, the Fourth Lascaris, as I mentioned, he uh, was left as a as a boy. Okay, so uh, Michael the Eighth was co-crowned co with him in still in Nicaea. Okay, and uh, they received. Uh, an intelligence information from Nicaea that actually uh, Baldwin, all right, was it Baldwin? Yes, I think it was Baldwin. Baldwin, uh, who was the king of uh, Constantinople, he was on an ex military expedition elsewhere. And sympathizers to the Nicaeans, they opened the side door in the wall. So, and thus most of the uh, Latins, they evacuated from the city by sea, right? And now, okay, so it was an easy prey, an easy target, okay, to take over Constantinople. But much more complicated task was, what are you going to do with this? Right, what, what are you going to do with this? Okay, basically, it's a liability. Uh, I mean, you know, you just uh, have now to rebuild it, to invest, reinvest in this, and so on. And it was similar, actually, to what happened when Mehmed II took the city. Because we sometimes just see it black and white, all oh, those Ottomans, they took it over, and now it seems to be a Christian city. But in fact, uh, Mehmed calculated whether it was worth investing in Constantinople. Uh, and there were strong voices that uh, uh, persuade him not to remove the capital from Edirne, from Adrianople to Constantinople. And we will be talking about this later on, but it's also that's a historical approach, not sort of mythological approach that we often use when we deal with history, kind of us versus them, but reality always more complex. Okay, so, and now Michael VIII did his crime 
against 11 year old John the Fourth Lascaris, who became an, an, an unfortunate hostage of the whole situation. So, by order of Michael on Christmas Day of 1261, his uh, sight was taken out of him. And as Pachimeras, uh, a, a chronicler, described, it, they, they, they didn't want to do any physical damage to him. So they, they used very, uh, they used piece of metal that was very, uh, very hot, and they would uh, move it in front of his eyes like that, very close, before he would lose his uh, his sight. So kind of he really sort of tried to remain humane at some point. So, uh, but Patriarch Arsenius considers this act uh, as uh, a, a terrible inhuman act of brutality and Michael was uh, excommunicated. And since there were other uh, prominent Byzantine noblemen who had a grudge against Michael, it's also kind of came together with gen to master a position. So Michael suffered from this ex uh, excommunication until the end of his life. And his son Andronicus, who was a pious man, he could not really uh, bury his father properly. So it also gives you an idea about the power of the church in the Byzantine Empire uh, that uh, the church in Russia uh, had never had on the same level, sort of to stand up against imperial authority like that. It was quite unprecedented for Russia. So they continued at the same time uh, to employ uh, Matrimonial, matrimonial uh, diplomacy, marrying members of the imperial family right now to various houses of Europe. Okay, so in order to foster to foster political alliances, and we will look a little bit about relationship with Mongols. Okay, and Michael even married off his daughter Maria uh, to. Uh, a Mongol Hain, and she later returned back to Constantinople, and she became uh, she she lived in a convent, and her convent uh, actually let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Her convent is the church of this convent is known until nowadays, exists until nowadays, is and it's called uh, Church of Maria of Mongols. Okay, so it also gives you idea how bad things were if uh, a Porphyrogenita princess uh, was married to not even a Christian, like when Holy Prince Vladimir uh, was about to uh, receive Anna, conditions were that he would become a Christian. Right now, there were not conditions like that. Again, right? So, So I, if I said Andronicus, it's it's Michael. So she's Michael's daughter. Okay. And let's see the church. Here, it's this church hosted the Ecumenical Patriarchate for a while after uh, after uh, the after after Mehmed II took the city. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. So now Pope Urban the second, he uh, he started to preach crusade because he considered that city belongs to uh, the Latin Kingdom, and no one really interested in this offer, but this offer was taken by Charles Charles of Anjou, uh, the French ruler ruler of Sicily, who 
who previously already uh, was successful with Pope's blessing. So, and he made a deal uh, with uh, Baldwin II, okay, with Baldwin II to restore him back in Constantinople. But Michael at this time decided to invite Venetians back because remember Genoese, I'm sorry, I didn't say it, yes, actually to uh, regain Constantinople, Michael used Genoese, people of Genoa, and he settled them in Constantinople. Now he decided to invite back Venetians that they would not provide Charles with the fleet because everyone, whoever had in mind moving around uh, the water, moving around the sea, would have to deal with Venetians. So now Venetians were not interested in letting uh, Charles of Anjou to take over the city because they wanted to have it for themselves, right? But also when he was about to embark on this uh, crusade against, against uh, the Greeks, as they would call them, right? A revolt happened, the so-called Sicilian Vespers in Palermo, where, where the French as uh, occupying powers were, were uh, slaughtered by the Sicilians. So in the word mafia, which is probably an Arab, Arabic origin word from the time when Sicily was under the Arabs, started to be used around this time, okay, in, in the context of this revolt. So look at Byzantium in 1265. So kind of, it's more than uh, was in the uh, 15th century when there was a joke that Constantinople doesn't need an emperor, all it's need uh, was a mayor. So you cannot really say it now. There you see, there are still uh, significant, significant territories, right? That basically were regained, regained by Byzantium. But nevertheless, clock were ticking, not in, in the favor of Byzantium, okay? Now, in order to uh, undermine <coughs> Pope's appeal to crusade, uh, that no one else would take this offer up, right? Michael VIII, he, uh, he sent an embassy to the Roman Catholic Council that assembled in Lyon. And in this council, uh, Gregory Acropolitis, a diplomat, he, on behalf of his Lord, uh, Michael VIII, subscribed to Roman Catholic Confession of the Faith with Filioque, right? Also, he admitted that the Bishop of Rome would have right to interfere, sort of kind of, in this sense, it was like development of the previous centuries of history of appealing when the Byzantines would appeal to Rome to authority of, of, of the Bishop of Rome in their inter-ecclesiastical disputes. And also, also Michael VIII was developing the notion of, uh, of, uh, the emperor as the supreme chief leader of the church, right? But it didn't work this way. It didn't work this way because San Fedor of Studios, San Fedor of Studios, at the beginning of the ninth century, there was famous conversation, I believe it was with Emperor Theophilus. And he mentioned that God established prophets, I mean, to the effect of this, God established prophets, God established priests, but nothing said about, about the kings in the, in the Christian context. So he kind of pointed out that basically an emperor didn't have much to do with the church. Of course, it would contradict Justinian's understanding of symphony and so on. But now uh, to prove 
this uh, model that uh, Michael the Eight uh, uh, tried out in uh, Leon, right? It had to be proved, it had to be seen how this model is going to work. And it didn't work because uh, the Orthodox people revolved around the empire. They disobeyed the famous case of monks of Zagrafu who were born alive and so on, who are commemorated uh, every, every compliant in Jordanville, right? And so on. Uh, and all over the empire, even the members of the Michael VIII Owen family, they, they dissolved him. So it's, it didn't bring stability. Yes, I, we, we should mind that Michael did it for the sake of the empire. That's important to understand. It's unfair not to mention this. But he did it to save the empire. He, he probably paid to some extent lip service to uh, the Roman face, but also, uh, the Latins, they didn't really trust that he was very sincere. They believed that he was less than sincere in his conversion because a special expedition was sent to Constantinople. And Michael had to take them on a tour of a jail, pointing out his own members of his own family uh, that who kept in the jail because of their uh rejection of this union of leon so it didn't work uh, just by the order of the imperial power and this lesson was learned 200 uh, 100 plus years later at the council of ferrara in florence in 1438 1439 they took into account uh, this uh, lesson of the council of nice uh, council of leon so Michael Suxia died, as I mentioned, uh, in 1282, leaving his son Andronicus and leaving also a lot of problems for Andronicus. Uh, one of the problems was that he, his father was excommunicated. His father also uh, brokered this ecclesiastical union that, which became divisive. And now in the church, there was orthodox resistant party led by the previous patriarch joseph and there were followers of patriarch arsenius who believed that uh, those followers they believe that since arsenius didn't recognize any patriarch after him so everyone else was uh, outside of the church even those Orthodox who resisted this uh, union of Leon, they were not, also not quite Orthodox for the followers of Patriarch Arsenius who received the name Arsenites. So uh, it's all didn't contribute to stability. So a major, major, major concern, major concern of course of, of an, any emperor would be to maintain stability. So nevertheless, Andronicus uh, succeeded in uh, reconciling with, Arsen with Arsenites in 1310 in very interesting way, because Arsenites, they had their demands and their demands were fulfilled. Like uh, a patriarch who was at this time, he uh, asked forgiveness in, in front of Arsenius relics that were solemnly brought into the city uh, with the help of Byzantine navies and all sort of their demands to repent uh, were fulfilled. But then of course, the Imperial church swallows them up. It would be like in the 19th sort of the Russian church would uh, accept all uh, all points made by Metropolitan Vitali, and Metropolitan Vitali would come to Moscow, and uh, the Patriarch Alexis II would ask forgiveness and uh, for uh, compromises during the Soviet time, and Metropolitan Vitali would give his absolution. So that's also another interesting account. Okay, so I'm not going to to speak about this in detail. Okay, so 
right. Right, it was Metropolitan Nifon, the one who who became PHR. So he proclaimed forgiveness to the entire Byzantine church on behalf of Arsenius. It's a very peculiar act from the church point of view. Very peculiar, interesting, interesting act in history. But nevertheless, uh, regardless how they saw it, they saw that the Byzantine church joined them because they were the only remnant of the Orthodox church. But I think from the point of history, they, they just swallowed up I mean, the, the, the Byzantine church digested them, okay? So, and it also gives you, gives us idea about ecclesiology. If you try to sort of go in black and white and sort of in this sort of vision, like uh, what happened to the iconoclast church, right? Sort of when the Byzantine church was under iconoclasm, you cannot really say once they, had the council in the seventh, uh, seventh ecumenical council. So they repented and they became once again the Orthodox Church, right? And so uh, it's really impossible to say that all this time, the, whatever was done there, all baptisms and all uh, sacraments while they were iconoclast, they didn't have any validity. So I don't think it was treated this way. Uh, Andronicus even wanted to, uh, I mean, unfortunately, similarly to the previous acts regarding the army, when army was uh, reduced, Andronicus wanted to outsource uh, Byzantine fleet to Genoese, and it was a, a bad move, it was my, a myopic move, because then you are at a uh, at mercy of, of of foreigners okay so in your own in your own backyard okay so in 1298 andronicus married his five-year-old daughter simonida to serbian king stefan milutin who apparently really wanted to be in relationship with her and probably, I mean, they waited for a while, but when they started to have a spousal relation, it still was probably too, 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 too early for her. So her, her health was damaged and she ended up at home. It also gives you idea about bad stories of those uh, diplomatic marriages. Okay, now let's see at another battle from the uh, adversary's point of view. Uh, It was the first important battle in the history of the Ottoman Empire established in 1299. This battle has passed between the Byzantine Empire and the Ottoman state. Osman, who declared the independence of the Ottoman state was expanding its territory towards the Byzantine Empire borders and became a serious military force. And he has also besieged Iznik, one of the most important castles of the Byzantine Empire in Anatolia. The governor of Iznik asked for help to fight against Osman Bey from the Byzantine Emperor. Byzantine Emperor II Andronikos Palaiologos sent 2,000 mercenary soldiers to Anadolia. Head of the Ottoman state, Osman had 5,000 cavalry. 
Osman Bey succeeded in defeating the Byzantine army in the pitched battle in Koenhisar on 27 July 1302. This battle was also a symbol of the Ottoman state who had a strong army now and the Byzantine Empire faced a strong enemy. Osman has longer begun to domineer the Byzantine territories in Anatolia. Okay, so now mind that, that Osmans, they are not Seljuks. This is new branch of Turkish people, okay? So basically, uh, and this is how uh, it became known as, uh, as uh, Ottoman Empire. It's another, another spelling of the same word, Osman. So those mercenaries who were mentioned, they were Spaniards, so-called uh, Catalan company. Okay, and uh, the problem with them was that they soon realized that because I mean they didn't really have any loyalty. They were uh, foreigners, outsiders, who were soldiers of fortune. So, but they realized that they could not. No, there is no one else there who could stop them. So they started to terrorize Byzantine population. Okay, they received name of Catalan Company. And this became another headache uh, for uh, for the Byzantines. Okay, so they started to take territory in modern day Greece, uh, and it gives you also this map. I hope you can see this well. I hope you can see this map well. Okay, gives you gives you idea, right? about new settlers who started to, to populate the heartland of the Byzantine Empire. Okay. So, this one, okay. You are seeing this Catalan company, right? Da. Okay. So, so now there are people totally outside of all, totally disconnected with the land, totally outsiders, right? That basically, and the empire could not really apprehend them. Okay. So that's, that's quite pity. That's quite pity. Okay, all right. So I think this, that brings us to the end of this class. Uh, and in next class, we will be dealing with, uh, God willing, with uh, the 14th century, with the civil wars of the 14th century. So if you really ask about uh, the, Byz the Byzantium in the 14th century, that would be civil wars. Another thing that I'm not sure if I will have time to cover, but I hope you yourself explore this or pay attention in your textbook, is uh, uh, the uh, Paleologian Renaissance in art, 
there this is very well documented period of history there are a lot of writings you can kind of choose and you can uh, sort of cr cross question them those sources and the same is uh, true about also intellectual literature there were various uh, various philosophical theological astrological treatises produced in byzantium at this time and there is also very beautiful i mean beautiful iconography beautiful church architecture that was that's also associated with uh, the same uh, paleologian paleologian uh, 